Good morning, everyone. Uh, so <laughs> it's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so we'd like to start off uh, these Creative Morning gatherings acknowledging that uh, the Victoria Arts Council conducts our business on the traditional uh, territories of the Lekwungen speaking people that we refer to today as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich First Nations, respectively. Uh, we honor this um, acknowledgement, uh, knowing full well that there is more work to do, it, to do ahead and uh, to commit to uh, reconciliation in various ways, including um, through education and lectures, as well as conversations. So um, my name is Kagan McFadden, and I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Arts Council. And uh, I am very excited for today's creative morning, and I'll pass it over to uh, the co-lead here, Leah McInnes, uh, to introduce our speaker. Leah, don't forget to unmute. Thank you, Kagan. Um, so my name is Leah McInnes. I'm uh, outreach coordinator at the Victoria Arts Council and co-lead of Creative Mornings, as Kagan said. Uh, so I want to welcome you here uh, to the Victoria chapter of Creative Mornings. Uh, this month, our theme is kismet. When the stars align and good fortune visits, it must be kismet. An unexpected windfall, a chance encounter with another that blossoms, a doorway opening to impossible dreams. Kismet is a little pocket of time just for you. We marvel at the sheer unlikely wonder of these moments. Our Istanbul chapter chose this month's exploration of kismet and Selin Sinar illustrated the theme. We'd like to thank MailChimp, uh, Creative Morning's official global partner for marketing. This month, um, MailChimp would like us to tell you about um, their collaboration with It's Nice That. Uh, they've created The Movers and Shakers, uh, The Movers and Makers. It's a new series shining the spotlight on creatives as they share stories, strategies, and secrets behind their business growth. Uh, and I'll put a link in the chat for this if you'd like to check it out. It's mailchimp.com slash and co slash movers and makers. We'd also like to thank the City of Victoria for their ongoing support, uh, as well as HCMA. HCMA is an architecture firm that designs buildings, brands, and shared experiences that connect people. Uh, so um, as Kagan mentioned, as hosts, um, we are the Victoria Arts Council, and I wanted to tell you about our current exhibition, Crossroads. It's the 2021 Grand National Fiber Art Exhibition. So this is a touring exhibition, um, over 40 artists. And tomorrow is our Artists in Conversation. If you happen to be local, come down to our main gallery at 3 p.m. We're going to have uh, five artists in attendance um, speaking about their work in the exhibition. Uh, I'd also like to take um, a moment to talk about um, our chapters in Ukraine. Uh, so the Creative Mornings headquarters reached out to our Ukrainian chapters and asked them what they need, and they provided a list of resources. Um, and if you'd like to see those resources and, and help out if you can, um, that link is on the creativemornings.com uh, main website page. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker um, this month, Marie Metaphor Specht. So Marie Metaphor Specht is a multidisciplinary artist and poet living on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. The vocabulary of the sea, the chlorophyll dialects of the forest and the anchor of this soil are integral to her work. Marie's poetry has been published in anthologies and journals, both in print and online. In addition to her independent work, Mary, Marie has collaborated with musicians, filmmakers and lighting technicians to create elaborate and often interactive works. She has performed at a wide variety of venues ranging from festivals and interdisciplinary arts events to literary events and poetry slams and has been coaching youth poets for over a decade. Whatever form her work takes, Marie leads with compassion as she composes moments of nourishing intimacy and connection. She believes in reckless acts of beauty 
She believes in the power of stories shared. So I'm going to pass it over to our speaker this week and month, Marie. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Leah. And thank you for acknowledging the territories, Kagan. I too am broadcasting from the unceded Lekwungen and Sanchofen speaking territories. I'm so fortunate to have been living, working and raising my family here for over a decade. I was born in the Rockies of what is colonially known as Alberta. Um, and I'm so grateful for these lands that have nurtured me and the peoples who have been stewards of these lands since time immemorial, since the first settler arrived. In many ways, my work um, as a spoken word poet and an artist, I'm engaging in the act of storytelling. Collectively, we've been doing this oral storytelling thing for a long time. And I'd like to acknowledge the rich history of oral traditions that have existed on these lands since time immemorial. Oral storytelling is one of the most ancient human activities. Uh, it's one of the ways we try to make sense of the world and a way we make meaning of our lives. And it's a huge part about how we like learn from each other. So today's talk will be presented in the form of a story with a series of smaller stories couched within it. These stories come from my own life and my journey into my creative practice. But like any good story, the aim is that some element of it resonates, that you find a bit of yourself and some small part of this story. So we're here to talk about kismet and how it relates to art making and creative practice. It's a really big topic. Um, if you think about it, each of us is here in this particular time and place, thanks to a long series of loves, losses, near misses, chance encounters, stretching as far back as we care to look. Wherever our individual beliefs lie on like the spectrum of chance versus fate, we can all acknowledge the vast sea of circumstance behind us as we face whatever the future holds. Sometimes, if we're paying attention, we get to appreciate singular moments in time that feel amplified, otherworldly. Moments that function as a crossroad in the narrative of our lives. So the process of laying claim to my own creative practice has involved both steady work and intentional ongoing reflection like it does for all artists. After all, what is art if not a deep listening to self? Throughout this continuous process of intentional becoming, there have been moments like points of light that shine a little brighter in the narrative. Moments that feel as though they were handed to me by somebody else while simultaneously being written on my bones in my own hand. Moments that have quietly but firmly nudged me in a new direction. Moments I recognize and claim as my own. Some would call these moments kismet. So I've selected a few of these bright moments to discuss with you today. I'm in the process of drafting my manuscript for my first full length book. Um, it's slated to be published by Right Bloody North in the fall of 2023. And it focuses on themes of interconnectedness, the strength to be found in softness and the various ways we offer shelter to each other. So I've been thinking a lot about how people bump up against each other while we bumble through life. And sometimes the people that, that we are. I've been thinking about how we have this need to both build each other up and destroy each other and how even that destruction is a strange form of creation. I've been thinking that the love we have to offer the world is in many ways a patchwork of the love we have received. And these ideas have permeated my creative practice. So I'd like to start by offering a poem that speaks to the net of ancestry and community that not only shelters us, but is a part of our very fabric. So I wrote this poem after working on a collaborative weaving project with a group of high school artists. Um, and it features some language used in weaving. So I just want to share some of that language with you before I start. So a loom is the frame or structure that holds threads when we're doing a weaving. And the warp um, are the threads that usually run top to bottom and are stationary, while the weft is the threads 
that weave in and out of the warp, kind of like this. So this poem is called, How Beautifully We Are Unmade. There is a canopy stretched on a boundless limb. It is forever being assembled. It is forever being unmade. There has always been this tireless weaving. The star trails of my ancestors form the sturdy warp of this shelter. In this life, many have offered bright strands of their love, pulled from the bottom of their own shelters. Many have unraveled, just a little, for me. I shuttle the weft of their offerings across the warp of those who came before. They twine to an indigo tapestry, always in flux. It is enough to fill the night sky, a hundred times over. It is enough to fill the night sky for a hundred generations. The night sky is full with our joy and suffering. So often I forget I am sheltered until I wrap my body in this cloth, my beginning, so tangled with its end. Sometimes my skin is woven indigo and my scars become star trails. Sometimes my fingers are loom. In this life, I have offered each tiny love and each vast love, a thread unraveled from my own raw edge. My bright filaments, a dismantled shelter in their hands. Look, I tell them. Look how you can build yourself. Look how beautifully you can be unmade. Thank you. <laughs> so the themes that are present in my poetry and performance also show up in my visual art. Um, I'd like to show you a collaborative interactive installation called Love Begets Love. So I'll just have to do the screen sharing thing here. Um, all right, so you should be seeing two images. Yeah, all right, wonderful. Um, so this is two side-by-side -side images. One is the installation by day um, and the other is it lit up at night. So Love Begets Love is an interactive modular installation consisting of a network of handmade tissue paper lanterns raining down from a cloud form that can be mounted and adjusted to suit various indoor and outdoor venues. The addressable LED light driven by the Aurora program created by Limbic Media, which essentially listens to sound and translates it into light, color, and pattern. So as the title suggests, the work explores love as an infinite resource um, and colored light moves from one heart to the next, much the same way love can move through a community. All right, so here's a close up of the lanterns. They're faceted to represent a prism or a crystal. By day, the installation night light is reflected in the spectrum, representing the diversity of a given community. Uh, there's also a picture of Gabrielle, my collaborator on this project, who works at Limbic Media and played a huge role in designing and creating the Aurora program that drives the tech end of this project. Um, so the circumstance in which this collaboration came about feels a bit like kismet. One day, Gabby called me up out of the blue and said, do you wanna collaborate on a project? She had just moved back to town after a huge life shift and was looking for a constructive project to do. And I was absolutely enthusiastic at the opportunity to collaborate with such an accomplished artist whose skill set was like so different than mine. I don't know how to talk to computers personally. Uh, we proceeded to meet up, drink wine or tea. And while we did this, we talked about various people we love or have loved. And we did this while crafting these tissue paper heart-shaped lanterns. 
And the project grew out of that. So I'm going to play a little video for you so you get a, a chance to see how the light can move the project. All right. Let's turn on the music and tell you a bit about it, a bit more about it while you're watching this happen. It turns out uh, people really enjoyed our Rainbow Hearts and we had have had so many opportunities to install the work in various uh, locations at different festivals and events. So this is at the Vancouver Opera Festival in 2018. Um, and since it's a modular sculpture, we can adjust how we install it to suit the space. Um, in this situation, we were under like a covered walkway and we were able to kind of set it up with two or three walls so you could like walk into it. Um, and you can see here how the light sort of moves from heart to heart. What's really great about the Aurora program is um, we have an app on our phone that we can then connect to the program and change the color palettes or the patterns or turn it onto sound reactivity or have it play a, a program that was predestined. Um, and in this situation, you can see there's a fountain in the background. So the sound reactivity um, never really functioned. We ended up just running programs instead. Um, which would you know, pulse a, one color of light in one heart and move it to the next. Um, but my next slide, I can show you a situation where we did have the sound reactivity set up. Go back to my slideshow. All right. So, here is an example of Love Begets Love installed at the Otherworld Regional Burning Man event in Cowichan Lake here on the island. Um, this event is really close to my heart. It is very participation driven, um, very experiential, um, and there really is no line between performer, artist, and audience. Everybody is there participating together. And in this situation, we were able to set up um, Love begets love in a in a dark forest path. There was nothing behind us except for a pond with frogs that would start up at night. Um, and we set it up as a stage, kind of like an unpersoned open mic, gorilla open mic situation uh, where we had carpets out and seating, and then we had a microphone and we had it hooked up to sound reactivity. So people could come at their leisure and perform songs or poetry and have the hearts react. Um, to the what they were offering the community in terms of performance and I've got to tell you it was something else uh, for me as a poet to be able to perform my work around these themes and have my art respond in color and light. Um, so the next slide this is when we installed at Vancouver Pride. Um, in this case we did it more in like a 360 degree chandelier configuration and it was hoisted up quite high because it was downtown Vancouver in um, Davy Street Plaza. Uh, we did rent a mic from Lana McQuaid and took a risk and left it out in front of the art project with it hooked up to sound reactivity. Now, um, rainbow hearts and love moving through a community is a really great theme for Pride. So it was really effective for what was happening at that event. Um, but the city gets really busy and everybody's celebrating and especially in that part of town after the parade goes through it's really difficult to find your way into a restaurant or a patio because they're all quite full um gabrielle and Wait, i Marie, went i don't back to i don't want to uh, interrupt just to check on it and see how everything was going and we were greeted by hundreds of people coming together celebrating together in the square singing songs into the microphone and watching the hearts respond um and it was a, it was a really, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. It was such a great moment. Marie? Yeah? 
Uh, sorry, to interrupt. It's just we still see the video slide on the screen. Oh no, and, uh, really? People in the chat are starting to get anxious because oh. it sounds so amazing what you're describing, and we'd love to see the pictures too, if possible. Oh my goodness! Well, let me pop back. Thank you for telling me. No problem. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see? Is it different now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So good. this is yeah. the the Vancouver Pride slide that I was talking about. The chandelier, and this is if it will let me go back. Oh, here we go. Here is the other world regional Burning Man event, the one um, in the forest where we had it set up as a stage with seating and everything. All right. Okay, so I will go back to this. Right. Um, yeah, so this is an art installation I had the opportunity to create quite recently, and it's a living, growing thing. We're um, adding to it. We want to add some lightning bolts to the cloud form um, in a response to some of the uneasiness of the last few years, and um, we are installing it again this summer with the additional lightning bolts and perhaps uh, some storm lighting in the cloud form with the hearts raining down from it. Um, so it's going to be kind of a version 2.0, and we're looking forward to installing that in July in Merritt for a music festival. Um, yeah, so I've always been an artist, and I have a very clear early memories of drawing and writing. I have this one particularly clear memory of finding a children's easel under an early Christmas tree. I remember feeling so exhilarated just seeing it there. But I come from a family that for many valid reasons struggled to see how art could be a viable career path. My father immigrated to Canada in the 70s and met my mom working in the fine dining industry in Banff. They worked hard and valued my education. I was the first person on either side of the family to graduate high school, let alone go on to post-secondary. It was a really big deal and there was a lot of pressure that came with that. And art was always something that I would do on the side but I needed to choose an educational path that would lead to a real career. So I went into education. Turns out I love teaching <laughs> and I still do, particularly arts education, particularly with teens. I did quite well and was managing secondary school visual art programs right out of university, all the while trying to fit in my own creative practice on the side. When I moved here to Victoria, I ended up running an international baccalaureate art program at a prestigious pri private school. It was a demanding program to run, and I occasionally found myself fitting in the odd poetry performance or painting. The teaching left little time and energy for art. I didn't have a regular practice, and sometimes I even found myself feeling these ugly jealousy feelings of the studio time that was afforded to my students. Somewhere during all this teaching and moving, I met my partner, Paul. And our meeting and coming together as partners was one of those bright moments in the narrative. One of those moments of kismet that changes everything. And yes, I do have a poem about it, which you're going to hear. But before I share the poem, I wanted to share two little stories about Paul. Um, somewhere in the midst of all that teaching and moving, we were living together and I was deep in it and I hadn't um, had the opportunity to create for myself for quite a long time and I came home from work one day and I opened the door of the living room and he sat in the living room and Paul said to me you know I just thought if your easel was out and available maybe you'd find time to use it and by the way I found us an open mic that's poetry friendly that's happening on Thursday and I think we should go Sometimes little things make a big difference. And uh, yeah, I did, I did start finding moments to fit it in again. Kind of was one of those moments that woke me up a little bit. The other story about Paul requires that we go back in the timeline a little bit. You see, many years ago, prior to our romance, Paul and I were friends in the same tight-knit social circle, and he decided to head off on a trip to Central America without a return ticket. When we all said goodbye to Paul, we didn't know if or when he was coming back. Well, he ended up cutting the trip short and coming back in a state of medical emergency. While surfing in Nicaragua, he had like a serious accident. 
So instead of exploring Central America, he was at home recovering and I was his friend. So I started visiting him and our friendship grew into a partnership in a way that just wouldn't have happened if his trip had not been cut short. Years later, Paul and I would return to Central America together. On that trip, we would revisit the beach where the accident happened. When we stepped out onto that empty beach together, it was his first time back since he almost died there. When we stepped out onto that empty beach together, we were greeted by a sea turtle laying her eggs. That moment felt profound. It felt like a magnifying glass held over us, telling us, look here, this is important, pay attention. So this poem is called Turtle. We abandoned our backpacks and were washed up on the shore at dusk, holding hands in a net of woven seaweed. The empty beach felt like a cathedral, but we shared our net with the memory of a broken neck. And that beach wasn't as empty as we thought. The stone half buried in sand in the distance, upon closer inspection, was a turtle struggling under the crushing gravity of a world less buoyant. Each strand of that net held us together like a home, like a mother's hands, like the imagined lines that cross light years to form constellations, mapping out pretty pictures, finding the pattern in things, each point of connection a star. But it's so hard to see the shape of things when you're a part of its structure. That day on the beach, we were the rain and spring, as naked as the secret pearls and pride open oysters feeling the sun for the first time. Together, we were blood and salt and sandpaper, tears of gratitude on burnished skin and living flesh. That day, he alone was new, shaking the ashes off his wings. I remember how the dug up sand smelled like sleeping men impossibly fertile with hair tangled full of dreams that echo the crashing waves echo the crashing waves the crashing waves the same ones that danced him into a watery and desperate disorientation the last time he was here the last time he was here the ocean floor kissed him with such force he resurfaced sputtering out broken bits of teeth with a belly full of seawater and blood he staggered out of the surf with a vertebra that cracked under the pressure and a head he had to hold up with both hands. He left in the back of a pickup, strapped to a surfboard, watching the light play through jungle leaves while a stranger held his neck in traction. But he made it back home. And back home, the doctors would shake their heads at the impossible sensation in his toes, the miracle of his walking. It turns out what I thought was the crackling of dying embers was actually the relentless surf, pulling seashells, bits of teeth and shards of bone over each other, grinding them into sand. Our turtle had dug up that sand and built her nest. She was planting her eggs like seeds. With each one, her head would raise, then dip like a prayer. Each one a distillation, a concentration of all the effort it took to pull her angel's body out of the pounding surf so clumsy on land. Those same flippers that made such difficult feet scooped sand like a mother's hands. When she was finally done scooping and prayers, we watched her make her way back down the beach. So heavy. But she entered the chaotic embrace of those waves like a dancer, like a homecoming. And maybe it was something about my watery sight, but I swear I could see each star and all the invisible lines that connected them. Thank you. So Paul and I built a life together. I continued to work hard at teaching, trying to fit in my art practice on the side. But eventually, we decided to embark upon a long-term, collaborative, process-based art project. It was the largest scope of anything I have ever done, and we're still in the thick of it. 
that has really taken on a mind of its own and we're both reveling in the process while eagerly anticipating the changing form it will take in coming years. We decided to become parents. Now the standard narrative around being an artist while also being a parent can be pretty bleak. The story usually focuses on all the sacrifices one has to make in order to parent. The idea that you will have less time, even less time, um, to do the things you love. So imagine my surprise when I ultimately found the opposite to be true. Let me tell you a little story about how becoming Wolfgang's mother led me to finally making space for my own art practice. By the time I was pregnant with Wolfgang, I really needed to take some space from teaching. I had had a lot of success running that art program in the private school. The classes were full of young artists creating high level work. And it was super fulfilling to see how the program had flourished and grown. Um, it was magic to witness them discover their own capacities to create. And the success was a direct result of hard work and long hours, but I was ready for something different. Now, mat leave was a break from teaching, but it certainly was not a break. What a thing it was to shrink my circle of care from 150 students to one baby. What it was, what a thing it was to discover my capacity for love was even bigger than I ever thought possible. What an incredible shift in perspective and priority to contemplate the kind of life I wanted and the kind of home I wanted to build for this human, the example I wanted to be. So when I returned to work months later, the pressures that came with teaching in a high performance environment were all still there waiting for me. All the cares and worries were somehow amplified by my time away. I was back to working long hours, but this time with the added pressures of parenting. Although I loved teaching art, I was becoming more and more unhappy. And as you can imagine, there was now no time at all to fit in my own creative practice. I was on a treadmill. I was running around putting out fires. I was running an obstacle course while playing Tetris. <laughs> Whatever metaphor you need to understand that I was busily moving from task to task without stepping out to see the big picture until Wolfgang forced me to stop, forced me to take a breath and look around. It happened the day Wolfgang suffered a medical emergency at daycare that was dangerously mishandled. The people I had trusted to care for my child had made a near fatal mistake. Overnight, we went from having a safe place to leave our child while working to having no childcare at all. I was forced to climb off the treadmill and take stock. What was important here? What kind of life did we really want? I realized I had to quit my job. It was one of the hardest times in my life, but it was also one of those bright shining moments in my narrative, kismet, gently nudging me in a new direction, forcing me to take a risk and make a much needed change. There were a lot of false starts and it took some time to come together, but ultimately I ended up reconfiguring my life to balance teaching and a nourishing creative practice. I found I could do this in a way that left more time and energy for family. It was a risk, but I always thought that if I could just give my art some focus and space, it would grow to fill that space. It would become viable. And it did. Since shifting away from full-time teaching and reconfiguring my life, I have made Love Begets Love. I've published poetry, exhibited visual art, been commissioned for paintings, collaborated with artists and creators across disciplines, coached poets, taught workshops, offered and received and with support and art council. This process has led a book coming out next year. And yes, I still often find myself in classrooms across the city working collaboratively with young people in the arts, but I find myself doing this energized by my own creative practice. The word kismet is derived from the Arabic word quizma, meaning portion or lot. When we think of kismet as a predestined outcome of an event or a series of events, the question becomes, what of all this collective living actually belongs to us? What can we claim as our own? I'd like to think that we all have these catalyzing moments in our lives that nudge us in a new direction, moments that shine a little brighter in our narratives. 
moments that we can claim as our own. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Marie. Thank you so much. Um, it's not often that we are taken on such a roller coaster <laughs> of uh, narrative. Yes, Olivier is really a fan. <laughs> I think you've touched it very deeply this, this morning. Um, Olivier is joining us from Belgium, I believe, and he's, he's a regular, um, so we're happy to see him here today. Uh, but as I was saying, it's, it's not often that we get taken on such a roller coaster of um, storytelling and poetry, emotion and, and narrative, uh, interweaving sort of different histories, as well as kind of profound um, uh, shifts in uh, consciousness and, and an approach to art making. So thank you so much for, for weaving uh, such a, a rich uh, presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a it was a wonderful process to think about what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you you did um, you did a great job. <laughs> and now this is uh, sort of the portion where we open up the the discussion to anyone that with questions. If you're more um, comfortable writing in in the chat, that's totally fine. Um, or you know, feel free to uh, raise your hand and unmute your mic. And um, I think uh, we've got about twenty five minutes left with Marie this morning, so please don't be shy. Um, Anyone uh, have a question? Great, yes, marvelous, go ahead. Okay, well, I'd love to ask Marie, how important do you think that a calling is? And this, it sounds like what you're doing and started is a, is a, a, deep, a deep calling. And do you think it's important for every person to recognize that? That's a really good question. I feel like, the whole concept of a calling is um, can be a lot of pressure, it can be a lot of pressure to feel like you need to find your calling and do the thing that you need to do. However, the the flip side of that is if you do have that deep voice within you that's always been there whispering paint right do the thing and you stifle it and ignore it. Um, It, I, I mean, it leads to nothing but unhappiness for you, but also for the world for not getting to experience what you have to offer and what you will create. Um, it's a complicated issue because I come from a lot of privilege. I'm sitting here as the person who's university educated, who's white, who has privilege in so many areas of my life. So the, the whole concept of kismet and calling is is really beautiful when we have the tools that we need to go out and do the things that we want, but it's not accessible to everybody out there. Um, so it becomes this balancing act of because I can, because I can do the things that truly feed my soul and make me happy, it feels almost like a responsibility because for every person out there living their calling, doing their thing, there's, there's people who are born into situations where the struggle is huge and they might never get to, or they might only get to glimpse it once in a while. So I, I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but I, I think it's important to listen to what is the voice inside, what they're telling you to do, what, it's, what, what your drive is, um, and to work within the capacities that you have in the time and place. Thank you very much for that. My computer is uh, skipping out, so I don't know if it's just me or it comes from you guys or it's me. So I didn't hear the last part, but I heard enough to help me know that um, that it's very important and that uh, that's part of that's driving for life despite any obstacles around it, that the calling or path is uh, vital. It sounds vital. Yeah, yeah it is. And I think um, sometimes we need to pay attention to what's telling us that we can't, um, right? Because 
I touched on that a bit earlier is, you know, where did, where did we come from and what are the stories they're telling us that we shouldn't or that we can't or that we should be doing something else and to like really examine those and check the validity on it, right? Is this true? Is this, is this real? Um, and I mean, I think it's a process of questioning and risk taking. Um, and it's been a really long process for me. Like I kind of came into this a little later in life because I spent my 20s and early 30s really focusing on education. And I don't regret that time. Um, and I still do it. If I found myself in a position financially where I really could only only had to do whatever I wanted, I would still find a way to teach teenagers art at some point in my life because it is important to me. Um, but I think it was a long process for me to even be able to hold the identity of artist. Even though I had those early memories and that easel under the Christmas tree, I remember it. It's one of my earliest memories. And it, it felt like an open door. It felt like a thing that I wanted to have. Um, it took me until my mid thirties uh, to really be like, no, I am artist. I want to hold this as, as who I am. And I want to give it the space that it needs to exist. So I, I just think, yes, we have these voices inside us, but it's important to acknowledge the unique process that everybody is going to go through. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, so it looks like Olivier has a question. Yes. So first, really uh, full of gratitude about your heart. I pronounce well the, the H before the heart because you are an artist and it touched my heart. So, um, and I, I am a poet also. So my question, um, I have probably two questions in one question. Uh, the, the first part is um, what were the techniques that you used to make um, this uh, journey uh, bearable? when you had, were on the treadmill and you had these emergencies, where uh, what did you do to, to really calm down? Mm -hmm. And then the, the second part of the question is that, um, how, how did you do to make, the, to make peace with your old version of yourself that was satisfied of your life, uh, teaching at school with a classroom, etc. And to not blame yourself to oh gosh I'm uh, I, I need to move and I I'm, uh, I I have regrets so how do do you make peace with your old version of yourself? Thank you. That's a great question. I don't think um, I don't think I want to feel in conflict with any version of myself. It's not, it's more like we're Russian dolls and like Matryoshka dolls and the every version of ourself that's ever existed is inside us, right? Um, and I, I think I prefer to look back on uh, the Marie who was doing everything that she thought she should be doing and very unhappy while she was doing it. And, uh, you know, feeling jealous of her high school students having studio time. And I want to look back on her with compassion. I want to look back on her as I would a loved one um, like if we can, if we can learn to speak to ourselves, um, whether it's past versions or a current version of ourselves, with the same love and compassion that we would afford a child who we care deeply about, um, I think that's that's more the approach. Um, and in a practical sense, uh, getting off the treadmill, I, you know, I had like to get real, I had. Um, and the anxiety barely being kept under wraps. My kid, uh, I was teaching and I walked back into like a pot of boiling water. The school had become very, um, for various reasons, it was more stressful than when I left. Um, and then my child, Wolfgang, he had a medical emergency. He had an anaphylactic allergy at daycare that was mishandled and um, he, he just about died, to, to put it really um, frankly. And that kicked me off the treadmill. <laughs> it kicked me off the treadmill and onto the ground <laughs> with 
grass stains on my face. I didn't have a choice. It was just there was suddenly, suddenly I was faced with what was really important. You know, we had been the the situation in Victoria for childcare is very um, difficult. Like we had been on a, a wait list for that daycare while I was still pregnant for the for the year after the kid was born. Um, and and not having family in town, we really didn't have any other options. Like I, I really went from being able to work to being like, well, I'm not going to take my kid to any daycare now. I need to figure out how to recover from this situation that happened, leaving my child in care. Um, and so I guess for me, and I don't recommend this path, it was a real breaking down of all the house of cards that was keeping everything together. And um, through that breaking down, when you're, it's kind of like what I said earlier about how even destruction is the form of creation, through that breaking down into component parts, I could look at the pieces on the ground, pick up the ones I wanted, figure out how I wanted to fit them back together again. And that being said, it also comes with uh, the privilege of having a partner uh, who was like, yes, I have a stable job right now. We'll live with a little less financially and we'll figure it out. And uh, through figuring it out, what I came to is like, I really want to give it a go with this art. And I, I know I'm never going to make oodles of money with it but I do feel like if I focus on it I can get to a point where the labor um, is paid sometimes um, which in the reality of the capitalist world we live in especially when you have a kid you need to make decisions that are financially sound and it was an experiment and it was risky um, yeah but it's starting it's starting to work out I don't know I don't really know <laughs> I feel so um, I feel so incredibly lucky I guess. Um, did that answer your questions, Olivier? I'm just, I, I tend to go off topic. <laughs> oh, it looks like uh, Maya Rona has a question. It's, hi, hi, hi. My name is Meharuna. 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 Yes. Thank you for your for your um, um, presentation and sharing your heart. Uh, so beautiful. I, and I, I'm also a published writer and poet and um, I'm currently also working through my own manuscript um, focused on grief yes. and uh, grief and loss and Kismet is very much a part of of my being. So, so I totally get, you know, what, what you've talked about in terms of Kismet. I, I also, what I'm interested in knowing is how, when I love this line, what you just said about destruction is the form, is also can be the form of creation. Um, so what I'm interested in knowing is through the process of what you've written and, and especially when going back to the place where your partner was hurt, um, mm -hmm. It sounded, you know, sounds very intense and there's a lot of grief and loss. So my question is, um, what I, do you do as a creative, as an artist to self care when you delve into those processes of, of the, the hard processes of loss and grief in order, because Speaking from as a as an artist myself, I know there needs to be thought put into self care because that there's a lot of hard, dark places one can go. So I'm interested to know what you have done for yourself in in terms of self care. Thank you. Mm, thank you so much for bringing this up. I think it's really important. Is poets um, teaching and helping with their writing and performance, and this comes up a lot because they um, are young and experiencing all these feelings and wanting to write about it and share it. And there is an interesting line in uh, spoken word and performance between sharing your trials and struggles on stage, being an act of empowerment and an act of catharsis. Um, and bleeding on the stage in a way that's traumatic to the artist. 
And it's a fine line and it's something that um, is different for every person. For myself personally, making art about things that have been difficult is a form of exposure therapy. <laughs> because often I, I'll spend a lot of time writing then I'll revisit and I'll edit and I'll shift things around. And then if it's a poem that I want to perform, I'll memorize it. And the act of memorizing a poem about a traumatic event is textbook exposure therapy. Um, so if there is any trauma from that event, you, you have this amazing alchemic power to, to transmute that negative experience and turn it into something beautiful, right? And then you turn it into something beautiful that you share with the world. And this idea of resonance is really big that I, I think about this idea of um, when sound vibrates an object, an object that is shaped in a corresponding way will vibrate and amplify the sound. Um, and I think as artists, when we create work, we're hoping that members of the audience or people who encounter it will resonate with some small part of it, that they will have the right shape for that vibration and vibrate with it a little louder. And then that takes this experience and elevates it and um, yeah, makes it into something beautiful, makes it into something where people see seen. And I think um, seeing each other, what feels like such a unique, brand of suffering and joy um, but really seeing somebody in it and seeing yourself in what they feel is their unique brand of suffering and joy is like how we how we build those networks of community and um, those invisible networks that become nets that hold us and and when we talk about self-care I like to turn it back to community care because I think self-care there's only so much we can do for ourselves but um, I think having a community a network of people who you can share these experiences with, who you can edit your work with, um, who you can talk through the thing you want to write about until it gets to a point where you can turn it into something beautiful or something. And I say beautiful, like there are things that are very difficult that are beautiful. Um, turn it into something that is healthy to put out into the world. Um, and I don't think that we are meant to do that alone. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's a great question. Uh, um, so we've got about five minutes left. Uh, if there's any other um, pressing questions about Marie, I always love to know what people are working on upcoming. And, and thank you so much for letting us in on the fact that you're working on this manuscript that is slated for publication next year. Do you want to maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Is it going to be a collection of uh, sort of assembled works or all new work? What's it going to look like? Um, it's a collection of poetry and some older work, but surprisingly, as I've been working on the manuscript, or it's maybe not surprisingly, the older work has filtered out and I've been creating new work that speaks to these larger themes. Um, it's going to be called Soft Shelters, and uh, it's going to touch on eco-grief, what it is to love and parent in the slow apocalypse that we're all a part of, um, the ways in which we shelter each other, uh, that interpersonal connection um, and relating. Uh, and it's been just a wonderful process. I've been working with Alessandra Nakarado, who is one of my favorite Canadian poets, um, who published a book with Rick Books called Reorigin of the Species. It's quite good. And um, we have a really good thing going on with um, editing and mentorship right now. That's been probably some of the catalyst to me producing more new work that's going to uh, better encapsulate these large um, a sister publishing house of Right Bloody from the States, and um, their mandate is to publish poets that are predominantly spoken word. So uh, it's been a really neat process to go from sharing my work predominantly out loud with performance and voice and figuring out how to translate to that page when I'm not there to speak for the poetry when it must speak for itself. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I, it was the, the publisher that I wanted to work with. So I feel very fortunate that it's worked out in this way. 
Um, I am working on a new project at the same time while finishing up this one. Um, it's kind of in the research and development stages right now, um, but it's called Light Translations. Um, and I've been doing some work with Limbic Media who designed the Aurora program that drives Love Begets Love. You may have seen their work around Victoria. They do like the singing trees and any of the sound reactive lighting. Um, and so they've been getting these contracts to do these large walkthrough experiences in um, Ontario, where there's lighting installations um, peppered throughout like a dark forest path and uh, participants are driven through the art to the different stops by narrative. And I've been lucky enough to be taken on as a creative and hired as a, a poet to work with them, where I've been writing spoken word and hiring voice actors and um, working with the other creatives to uh, make the narrative that drives the, the art, um, the story that people hear when they participate with it. So it's been really neat, uh, but it's very much working for a client and um, but just really getting a sense of what we can do together with these technologies and these different creative um, inputs. So the light translations project is me peeling it back and starting with the writing. And I'm like, what if I dive deep into the nature of light and sound and start writing about that? And then we figure out what we're going to do with the tech after. Um, and I'm really um, fortunate and excited and so pleased that I have some support from the Canada Arts Council to do this research. So I've been able to um, contract some experts to just have conversations with me about light and sound and to just start seeing what comes out of this. And um, I'm really excited to see what I can do in the future with Limbic Media when we start from this more conceptual um, starting point and we're not working for a client, we're working for the pure um, expression. And it's kind of like, see where that goes. Mm, hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marie. <laughs> Um, I see we're just coming up to noon now, so I just wanted to thank you for joining us and for sharing so much about yourself and, and the work that you're doing and um, yeah I've really enjoyed this morning, so thank you for being here. Mm, thank you so much for having me it's been such a pleasure. Um, and just as uh, before we part ways, I want to say that um, our next talk in creative mornings. Victoria chapter is going to be uh, on the theme of now, and that's May 27th at 11, um, 11 to 12 on a Friday. And our speaker is Ma Marina Joaquin, who's going to be um, sharing about her, her current project and exhibition called uh, Natural Transformations, which um, uh, is, is looking at art as a, a healing force in our lives. Uh, mm. in her own personal story. So um, please stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, and well, have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye, bye for now. Thank you so much. <laughs>